cybersecurity, cyber insurance, cyber attacks, and more. We have a lot of content today and we want to make sure we get to everyone's questions. So we're going to jump right in. A little housekeeping before we get started. We do want people to submit questions and please do that using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. The session will be recorded and a copy of that recording will be distributed later. <clears throat> My name is Erin Trask. I'm gonna be your moderator today. I work with the Finance and Accounting Solutions team doing fractional CFO work. Um, I've had the opportunity to collaborate with Paul and Mark and so we're excited to answer some of your most pressing questions today about cybersecurity. While we're waiting for questions to come in, Paul, can you share why cybersecurity and cyber insurance are so important? And maybe introduce you and Mark. To yeah, the group. absolutely. Uh, as Aaron, as you mentioned, we've had the opportunity to work together uh, in the past, and you know it's always great to be talking to to you and all the attendees here today. Uh, a little introduction to myself, Paul Kennedy, um, senior manager here uh, with, at Raymond within our Raymond Technology Solutions Group. Uh, I help lead our cybersecurity consulting services. Um, and so spend a lot of time having discussions like we do, to, uh, we're having here today. Mark? Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, uh, senior manager, uh, security solutions within Raymond Technology Solutions. Uh, also spend a fair amount of my time helping clients with technology consulting, helping them put together technology strategies and also uh, doing cyber cybersecurity consulting as well. So I think we'll start off by um, kind of sharing some of our experiences and a little bit about cybersecurity before we really dive into some good discussion. Um, as Aaron uh, said at the start here, you know, we, we really would love to be talking through questions uh, from the, the audience here. Uh, so, you know, once we get through some of these materials, you know, as things come up or, or you have something in, in mind, definitely feel free to put that in the Q&A and very happy to, to jump to those as we, we get to that point. So uh, we'll start talking here a little bit about um, some of the things that we see. Uh, and I want to talk about also before we dive into a, a particular story that I, I thought was useful to share, just talking about why I think organizations tend to struggle with cybersecurity. Cybersecurity, just speaking frankly, is difficult. You know, there's lots of statistics out there that talk about that um, and really can show that. But the why it's so difficult, I think, can be hard to grasp. And we think about some of those statistics. Um, so the Ponton uh, uh, Institute uh, does a survey every year. And, and in 2022, they reported that 50% of companies had some sort of operationally or business impacting uh, cybersecurity incident in the last two years. Other studies have come out. There's a penetration testing company that you know tests the security of organizations. And they found that they, they in their tests, about 93% of organizations they tested could be infiltrated successfully to some degree. Know before, one of the leading cybersecurity awareness training organizations uh, estimates that for untrained organizations, 30% plus of the employees at those organizations uh, will likely fall for some sort of phishing attempt. Even after you do get into a training, you, know, you can reduce that risk by 10x. But that still leaves three to five percent of well-trained employees that'll fall for a phishing uh, attempt. And we think about the fact that there's all these attackers out there. Really, it's a global ecosystem of attackers. And you look at those statistics that are on you know above, and it makes sense why they eventually get to be successful. So we think about why they're successful again. Like we have to recognize that as defenders, we're at a disadvantage. The attackers only need to succeed once. They need to find one flaw in our security in order to get in and then go further. We have to find and block 100% on the other side. Much easier task, I think, to find one flaw than be perfect. Attacks are full-time business for these threat actors. Literally, it's a business for them. You know, the Conti group that broke up uh, recently, you know, there was information that was released about them and how they operate, and literally their business with HR functions, help desk functions, things like that, that, you know, the level of sophistication goes into an organization like that, where they're literally their business is attacking people, uh, makes it uh, easy to understand why they have so much time to dedicate to this. Meanwhile, on our side, you know, cybersecurity is usually not our core business. 
you know, it's a, it's something that we're doing in order to enable our core business. And it makes it harder to, to align those priorities. Oftentimes the attacker's tools are free or cheap. They can find them online easily. They share them amongst each other. Sure, there's some sophisticated tools that some particular attack group keeps to themselves, but a lot of the tools, free, cheap, easily found on the web. Meanwhile, all these sophisticated tools that we're buying on our end in order to try and help secure ourselves are $162 billion industry at the moment. And, um, you know, so you have to pay for those tools on our end and, and it makes it much tougher to be secure. Let's talk about a situation that um, had the pleasure, if you will, of, of assisting with. Uh, and I think Mark would, will probably share that, you know, this is very real and matches up with, you know, what he's observed as, on his end too. So we don't know exactly when this attack started, you know, because of the way the attack happened. Um, this was several months ago. Uh, a lot of the data was actually lost about that would have told us when the attack actually started. But the threat actor likely gained some sort of access by phishing an end user, like we talked about with that statistic from know before. They then used that end user's account machine to actually just kind of monitor the environment until they found some sort of misconfiguration or vulnerability that allowed them to then compromise a more privileged account or administrator account. That administrator account was then used to access critical infrastructure, figure out what was out on the network, and really see what there was to attack. Some point, a uh, day or two prior to the actual attack occurring, they actually went and appeared to have turned off the backups. So, you know, backups are a great tool, a great defense, but the attackers know that and actually went out of their way to turn off the backups. So they weren't failing, but they didn't succeed either. They, look, they scanned the network for all the data there was to steal, started transferring that out uh, the evening before the attack. And then about 4.45 a.m. the next morning, they actually activated the ransomware. In that time period where they actually activated the ransomware, around 3.30, they, you know, they actually established the connection home to where they had their attack tools, downloaded those attack tools, and started scanning the environment for the different computers, workstations, servers they could encrypt. They downloaded the ransomware and an anti-antivirus -anti tool. So uh, a lot of people rely on AV to secure their environments. Attackers know that. And so they actually have their own tools that disable that AV so it doesn't actually work when you need it to. They then use that tool to actually disable the AV. They disabled other IT tools in the environment that would have actually allowed the, the IT team to respond more effectively. And about 4.45 AM, they triggered the attack. They clearly had been in there for a few days. So they knew that actually this was a manufacturing company that started um, their shifts around 5 AM. So 4.45 AM seems to be quite a coincidence. They actually triggered it right before the uh, folks would start showing up for the, that day. So, Behind the scenes, systems are getting shut down. Um, they successfully encrypted uh, pretty much all of the actual IT systems. Thankfully, the manufacturing environment itself wasn't hit at this company. They had appropriately separated that out. But uh, people showed up 5 a.m., discovered this ransom note, and that their systems didn't work. Their core ERP system didn't work. The file shares they normally would access didn't work. Um, 5.30-ish rolls around, uh, you know, calls start going around. The IT team is scrambling to figure out what they can do, but they can't connect to any of the resources from home, and they weren't on site yet. Um, I got the call around 5.30 myself. That was quite the wake-up call. Uh, I rolled out of bed and, and pretty much rushed out the door to 20 minutes to the site uh, where this was. Got on site about the same time as the some of the leadership team, and then we started scrambling. This was an organization that you know, I just started working with in, in more seriousness. So we hadn't put some of those plans in place yet that, you know, we were, we now have um, worked with, you know, I sat down with the CFO and we knew that we would have to go activate our insurance coverage. They thankfully had good cybersecurity insurance that allowed them to actually get access to the resources and cover the cost of this incident. Um, they activate the insurance coverage, but it took them a while to actually even do that because they had to actually go talk to their broker to get the insurance documentation because the, that insurance documentation was sitting on the same network shares that had just been encrypted and they couldn't actually pull them up. The leadership team got together, built an ad hoc kind of incident response team. Uh, IT team started build, rebuilding some redundant stuff. We started having to talk to these uh, experts and outside sources that would help us to actually uh, respond appropriately to the incident and investigate what happened. Um, and so you can imagine 
you know, this is through kind of uh, just after lunchtime, that first day was quite chaotic. Uh, after, by the end of that first day, yeah, I can tell you there was quite a bit of frustration from the leadership team because they didn't feel like they were actually moving forward yet and fixing this problem. But they end that first day, they finally had approval to actually move forward and, and with an incident response team, a, a, a digital forensic and IR team. Uh, we brought them in, they, they installed their tools. We had the formal kickoff around lunch the next day. And finally, we're up and running to actually start investigating and figuring out how we clean up the environment and, and how to move forward. It wasn't until several days later that we started getting some all clears to, hey, it's, it's okay to start turning back on the environment. In the meantime, even though the manufacturing environment itself hadn't been hit, they were only running at about 20 or 30% effectiveness. Um, even though they, you know, all their actual manufacturing machines hadn't been touched, those I, those manufacturing machines heavily rely on the actual IT system still too, even if the machines themselves don't. As we keep moving forward, this is a process that really dragged out to actually get things back online. Day six, nearly a week later, about 20% of servers had come back online, but none of their key systems. Nearly two weeks later, 10, days 10 and 11, they finally get their core ERP system back online. Uh, email access was starting to be restored for users. They were very deliberately slow about turning email back on. Day 18, nearly three weeks later, they recorded their first actual shipment in their ERP system to a customer. They'd shipped some parts prior to that, but that was the first time they actually recorded it because that was at the point when they could. And it wasn't until about 45 days later that 95% of user accounts had been restored. Point being on all this, it took a very long time and that is very normal. There's a study out there that ransomware attacks take about 21 days or so to recover from. I think that's probably uh, the average and the middle. There's probably very few companies that actually take 21 days. There's probably a lot of companies that are adequately prepared and take three days. And there's a lot of companies that probably take two to three months. And so while these folks you know, were higher than average, I think there's a lot of other organizations out there that experience the same. So definitely something that I you know, I saw firsthand. Uh, Mark, anything you'd, you'd weigh in on that that you saw pretty similarly? Yeah, I mean, we stepped through a number of um, incident response situations and, and really the timeline that you laid out here is, is very typical of what we see. So um, when I think of a lot of the situations that Raymond uh, has assisted clients with in incident response situations. Um, I think the average that we were seeing was about nine days. And of course, mileage will always vary, um, you know, depending on size of the organization, complexities, stuff like that. Um, but I think the big takeaway here is, is, is the downtime and, um, you know, just how impactful that is to the organization. And, um, you know, when you start to factor in a lot of organizations that I talk to, um, when we're when we're talking about tech strategy and we're talking about cybersecurity protections and you know some of the incident preparedness, um, you know you start asking that question to say, hey, um, if you're down for ten days, how painful is that? You know how how impactful is that to the bottom line? You know a lot of organizations just don't have the budget uh, to be able to withstand that type of a situation, and so that's really where that cyber insurance backstop comes in to really help organizations kind of deal with this situation, but. Um, <clears throat> you'll have to remind me, Paul, but I believe this situation, um, you know, we, one of the things that we talk about in cybersecurity is, is like the mean time of how long a threat actor is in the environment. And I believe in this particular situation, this was an in and out pretty quick. And so yeah. we're starting to see where, you know, ransomware as a service is, is becoming much more of a, of an approach that threat actors are taking. Uh, where they're getting in and they're getting out. They're not spending a lot of time anymore uh, camped out in, in client environments. So, you know, again, that mileage will vary as well. But I believe if I remember correctly, and maybe you want to speak to that, uh, how quickly they got in and got out. Yeah, no, you, you raise a great point. I think there's, uh, from what I'm reading these days and, and what I'm directly seeing, you're, you're spot on. Uh, this was the, our, our team that helped us, they said they believed the attacker was actually in the environment. Uh, the attacker was believed to have been Black Vasta, by the way, for those that um, want to go look that up. They were believed to have been in the environment for maybe 24 to 36 hours, maybe two days. Um, so very short time frame. Now, the thing is, what you mentioned ransomware as a service. We don't know when they actually, the, the user account was compromised because Black Vasta probably bought it from somebody else. Um, but you're spot on. The other thing you, you mentioned, the nine day average, and you and I were talking during this instant and in the quote you said, actually, 
is something that I share with my clients, which is about nine days in, you'll probably finally feel like you have your feet underneath you and a plan of how to move forward. And that was spot on. Like literally it was day nine. I walked into our morning kickoff call and for the day. And that was what the feeling was in the room. We finally felt nine days in, like we had a plan of how to move forward and get back to normal. So. Paul, with that large turnaround time, Skip asked in the, the Q&A, did they discuss paying the ransom? Would it just have been easier and quicker to get systems back online if they paid it? Uh, it might have been quicker. I, I can, I'm can i probably free to share that uh, the attackers started with a $5 million uh, ransom. And so uh, that was, this is an organization's manufacturer, you know, you look at the size of the manufacturer and things like that was not gonna make sense to pay $5 million. Um, they they talked about it, but purely from the perspective of, is there information in our systems, which thankfully there wasn't much of like key employee data. They didn't have HIPAA information or some other regulated information in their environment that was really gonna drive a need to make sure it wasn't released, but they still cared very much about their employees and so wanted to make sure their employee data wasn't compromised. Thankfully it was you know a couple dozen folks at the top end that, that had some sort of impact from that. There was never really serious discussion uh, because of that. And so, um, you know, they did talk to them, but they they kept it pretty limited. <laughs> Paul, this is probably kind of a worst case scenario um, incident. I have a maybe what you could be considered a best case scenario example that one of my clients had, if there is such a thing as a best case scenario cyber incident um, that might resonate with some of the people on our on our call today. And this client had um a employee email payroll requesting to change their direct deposit account. Um, the employee email appeared legitimate. Payroll replied to it, asked a clarifying question, got a response, made the change. Um, come payday, the employee called payroll and said, hey, I didn't get my paycheck. And they said, well, it's in your new account like you requested. And they said, no, I didn't request a change. Um, upon further investigation, a threat actor had gained access to the employee email account, had set up rules so that the emails were going into a folder that was unmonitored. And so the client was only out one paycheck for an employee. They made the employee whole. And so there was minimal cost um, impact. It took them a little while to determine if it was a spoofed email or if they had actually gained access to the client email account or the employee email account. And then um, by the time they finished that discussion and conversation and decided, oh, we probably should talk to our insurance company. The insurance company said, well, you missed our timely filing. Um, so your claim would have been denied, even if it, you know this instance, it was below their deductible. Um, but then they also told them they didn't have the appropriate controls in place. So even if they had timely filed, it would have been denied because they only responded to the employee via email. They had to confirm verbally the change. Um, so Paul, what kind of red flags does this story set off for you when we're looking at cyber insurance? Yeah, and, and Aaron, um, you know, I got I got the pleasure of that one working with you on that situation. You did a great job of raising your hand saying, hey, this is something that we need some help on. Um, and, you know, in that situation, you're spot on, right? They, the red flags immediately jump out to me. They haven't um, actually really understood their insurance policy in terms of what it was going to require for them to even have coverage in the first place. Thankfully, the impact was small enough that they didn't need to actually activate the insurance policy. But if it had been, they wouldn't have had coverage because they didn't act quickly enough. And they didn't, um, as you said, have some of the security controls in place, like double checking that uh, transaction to change access or change a, a bank account was actually correct. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you need it's very important to know what's actually in your insurance policy. Um, not only are you getting coverage the right amount, but what are they going to require for you to keep your policy effective? It's been a number of court cases, including one prominent one in the last year, where uh, a large claim was denied and the policy rescinded because of the fact that the, the carrier hadn't done something correct. Mark, anything you'd add to that? Yeah, I mean, those are those are all fantastic points. Um, you know, I've been in uh, situations where organizations where typically business email compromise leads to some type of ACH or wire fraud. Um, where threat actors are monitoring communications, they intercept uh, vendors, uh, accounts payable, they target, you know, those that are obviously, you know, in financial positions within the organization and have authorization to make those kinds of changes. And, you know, one of the things that I talk about with these organizations that have been impacted by this is, is following their process and their procedure. 
Um, and many account payable you know, departments put these processes in place to safeguard the organization to go, hey, we are never going to make an account routing number change without a confirmation phone call, right? There's going to be some type of audit trail or documentation. Email is no longer sufficient, right? Because the way that threat actors are, are approaching organizations and, and getting into them, it makes it very, very difficult for just general run of business um, for these types of things to get caught. And that's really where you know, we talk about and why cyber insurance companies are leaning on baselines and protections and safeguards and having these things in place uh, is because there are tool sets and there's options available to all organizations to do effective monitoring, to understand and be aware of when a BEC situation could be occurring, right? So, yeah. you know, you think about why cyber insurance and their attestation statements are really pushing on multi-factor authentication as an example you know, having some type of audit logging available where you're monitoring what's going on, for instance, maybe in Microsoft 365, you know, you start correlating all of this stuff coming together. You're watching the phishing emails that are coming in. These are all things that are protective of the organization in these BEC situations. And so, you know, cyber insurers have, it, have incurred a lot of losses in recent years. Um, cyber insurance is still relatively a young industry. And so they're still figuring it out. They're still adjusting and adapting and modifying their approaches and their policies um, because they're trying to limit their risk, right? So you kind of think of uh, the good driver discount, right? So if you're a good, safe driver, if you're willing to put their their little box in your car and you're a good driver for you know the the, re the reporting period, they're going to give you a discount on your bill. So it's that type of mentality and methodology. And so cyber insurers are like, you know, business email compromise is one of those categories that they look at and they're going to say, hey, do you have these things in place? And being aware and accurate to what you're doing is going to be really, really important to make sure that your claim is not denied. Mark, Mark Sorry, Sorry. go ahead. Uh, real quick. Uh, actually, there's something you said that uh, or kind of a theme of what you just said that I think is really important to pick up on. Uh, so the insurance carriers are asking these questions for a reason. You know, it may feel like burdensome. It may feel like they're going over the top sometimes compared to how we've done business historically. But the reality is they're they're asking these questions because they have looked at the data on their end and they're seeing what actually has an impact in reducing cost and driving the ability for companies to get back to up and running quickly, which is probably, you know, that business interruption cost is probably one of the biggest costs of a cybersecurity incident. So things like you know MFA or or the security tools that you have in place or or the wire you know fraud and ACH change you know controls they're asking those for a reason and so yeah it can feel burdensome but I think it's important to know that yeah those things are important because they're good security and the things that are actually also going to keep you secure not just be the things that reduce your uh, your insurance premium so sorry Aaron go ahead thank you no that's okay. Mark Connie asked, she says she has a cybersecurity insurance policy, but how does she know if it's enough? Ooh, how do you know if you have great, the right coverage? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think it really starts with a good risk analysis of the organization, really understanding the data that you manage. Um, a lot of organizations have some blind spots in truly understanding all of the data and all the risk that they have within the organization. And it really starts with understanding that first. Um, you know, there's a, a training session that we hold for many clients. And, you know, one of the easy ways to do this is just, we, we like to call it like a swag calculator. Okay. So this is just kind of a, Hey, thumb in the wind kind of a thing. But as you think of your organization, what you do, many organizations will have non-public information or private or sensitive data it could be financial, could be healthcare. Um, all of these are containing account numbers, social security numbers, anything that would be considered sensitive or non-public. Uh, each one of those records, as we look at the 2022 global data average, the cost per record. So when we think of the street value of those records to threat actors, and we look at the overall uh, recovery costs associated with those records, the global average last year is about $164 a record. Now, that will vary by industry, so healthcare is a little bit on the higher side of the spectrum because um, those have a lot more value. But if you just think through the number of records that you have in the organization 
and you multiply the number of records and of course retention comes in there as well right because many of us have statute of limitations we've got things that we have to follow guidelines for how we need to store those records if you just do some quick math on that times about 164 per record that's going to give you about a, a, a general rough understanding of what your aggregate risk is and so when we start talking about it and a, a good cyber insurance broker and a good independent broker, they're always going to encourage you, if you can, invest in good protections and tool sets. Protect the organization. Because anywhere that you make that investment, you are taking risk off of the table. You're reducing that risk posture. And so what have, many organizations will do is because they've not identified that risk picture, they end up probably trying to transfer too much risk to the cyber insurance carrier. So they're looking for larger policies. In some cases, sometimes uh, policy stacking is required. And so if we don't really understand what risk we're willing to own and take care of internally versus what we're going to transfer to the cyber liability insurance carrier, we may, we may have a miss here. We may not have the right protections or coverages in place. But I think it's also taking a look at what do we do as a business? You know, what is our main focus? What is, what is it that we do as an organization where our greatest risks exist? Maybe it is business email compromise. Maybe it is ACH or wire fraud. Uh, maybe there's other things where we need to look at those sublimits or we need to look at those specific protections. Um, you know, having a good standalone cyber insurance policy is really, really important. Many organizations today uh, they can get a rider that's attached to their E&O or their general, and oftentimes those rider policies are not comprehensive enough to really fully cover all the risk and really be protective of the organization. I'll tell you what, in the last place you want to find that out is when you have to make that phone call and you find out, oh, this is this is not covered. This is not part of the policy. And so really identifying that stuff ahead of time is going to be super important that when you are working with that independent broker, you're having very good comprehensive conversations. They're looking at the market. They're also looking at case law and precedent. They're looking at what's happening out there as well. And they're going to generally give you some good recommendations based upon the risk posture that you have. But that's really where it starts is truly understanding where our risk is. Thanks, Mark. That's so helpful. It's a lot less straightforward than just saying this is the value of the building I bought or the car I bought. Yep. And, Paul, and you have a comment? As you think, yeah, as you think about industries that have typically probably just from my experience done less with cybersecurity, um, manufacturing is one that jumps out to me. You know, very much oftentimes these manufacturers don't have sensitive data records unless they're supplying the Department of Defense or something like that. Uh, but those organizations can still have massive impact from some sort of something going wrong. Downtime is, you know, really what is going to drive cost within these organizations. And, you know, as you look at, you know, when you go back through this presentation, you look at, I put down kind of the bottom of the, the timeline, how much downtime or how much effective production they had, you know, estimated at different points along the, the journey there. And they had very significant efficiency loss from having lost their ERP for an extended period of time. And so, yeah, they may have, you know, I think their data at most, they would have paid probably $50,000 just to, you know, save the cost of their data. But from a pure downtime perspective, um, you know, they're still working through some of the calculations of, of what's going to be business interruption, but things like that business interruption insurance are also key. What also, when you think about, is your insurance enough? The other things to think about are making sure your attestation form is filled out correctly because, you know, they're basing your policy on what's in your attestation form. You know, most of them are sending out these cybersecurity attestation forms about what controls you have in place. Uh, if you're wrong about what you've put in there, they may deny your claim. The other thing is the business interruption insurance and making sure that has enough coverage because that's made a huge, uh, a huge cost for a lot of organizations impacted these days. And, and that's a really important one, too, that I would stress because, you know, a lot of the clients that I will work with on a regular basis, I will ask that question, hey, have you calculated the estimated amount of cost that you would have per day of downtime? And many of those organizations have not gone through the heavy lifting of really understanding what that picture looks like. So when it comes time to actually establish that cyber insurance policy, understanding that, especially like what Paul's talking about in the, in the downtime portion of that coverage, 
understanding what that number looks like and understanding how much downtime are you willing to tolerate, right? Because that's also going to drive some of that metric. And so um, many organizations have not really thought through that and had that conversation. I would encourage that because that really does help you hone in on the protection that you actually need to purchase so that you're not purchasing, purchasing too much coverage where your premium is now considerably higher or you're underinsured where you're going to still have to feel some pain on the balance sheet after it's all said and done. Thank you. I'm I've heard... your, Aaron, I'm going to steal your thunder. And as we're talking downtime, I want to go back to a question that Bill asked earlier. Um, with quick turnaround of the attacker, it is in that case being 24 to 48 hours, would an air gap backup not make it quicker to get back to normal operations? So I would tell you that that company did a very good job with their backups. The attacker turned off their backups for that day or two, but they did have an air gap backups and their backups were not touched. However, what they found during the actual incident response is just having an air gap backup doesn't guarantee the data is safe. How do you know that by restoring that backup, you're not just restoring the attacker's access into your environment? So what they had to do is, you know, they had, you know, cloud-based offsite backups that a lot of the companies I work with use something similar. Um, and they would have to download these, these backup snapshots. Now they're downloading the full server image, which are very large files because the attacker also got to their internally hosted, you know, uh, servers, their VMware servers that actually hosted the, their infrastructure, they encrypted that stuff too. And so they had to download these full server images, which are, are hundreds of gigabytes, if not terabytes, and then not only download them to themselves, then send it to the defer, the, the investigation company to say, hey, can you restore this first and make sure it's safe to bring back online? And that was a huge portion of the recovery time frame. was not like they had good backups they could rely on, but they needed to make sure they were safe before they turned them back on. Yeah. And I think the other side of that question, and I'm, and I'm glad that you answered that, is, you know, I think, you know, a lot of organizations have to think long and hard about how they approach it and what they do, right? So one of the questions that I noticed in the chat um, was, hey, wouldn't it have just been easier to pay the ransom? You know, get systems back online. When you look at, in aggregate, all of the costs, the frustration, the downtime, you know, everything that goes into just basically trying to restore, um, wouldn't it just been, you know, quick, faster, quicker, easier just, just to, to pay the ransomware? And in some cases, there are organizations that do have to make that call because the entirety of their systems have been compromised to the point where backup is not effective. Um, they have no access. Um, it basically, all services uh, were disrupted. So for those organizations, they're at a point where if I don't restore my data, I don't have a business. I'm not going to be able to get back up and running. Now I have brand and reputational uh, uh, service delivery. I'm not delivering to my customers. And, you know, you can only go so long with that situation. The other side of it, too, is that um, there is actually a, and I can't remember the statistic off the top of my head, but there's actually a significant number of reinfections that occur when you do choose to decrypt the environment. And I will tell you that the decryption process is not fast. Um, it is very long. So they, the way that their encryption algorithms work on the threat actor side, super quick to encrypt really long to decrypt. Um, and the other side of it too is after you've decrypted that environment, one of the biggest things that's been damaged in the environment has been trust. Can I trust my systems? Can I trust my data? Can I trust what exists there versus the approach that Paul's talking about to say, hey, I'm going to download that image and I'm going to send it to a defer. I'm going to have them scan it. I'm going to have them verify that things are clean. Now you can do a follow-up engagement but one of the biggest things that's so difficult for organizations to get over is the mental thought that my environment is contaminated, it's, it's compromised. Mm -hmm. And so many organizations just choose to say, you know what, I, I, I am more comfortable burning down my environment and rebuilding it from scratch than to just pay the ransomware decrypt and then try to limp along while trying to reinstate trust. And so it is a very difficult conversation to walk through. Um, and there's a lot of pros and cons to kind of think through, you know, as you're making that decision. So how do you have any statistics on um, how often if somebody pays a ransom, they do or don't get the data back? Like, is there there's no guarantee, right? Like you pay the ransom? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump into that. I mean, there is no guarantee. 
Um, but the other side of it is this is a business for them, right? So right. just like our business has a reputation, you know, many listening today, their their businesses have a reputation. They want to have a reputation that they're going to give you the key, right? Because it, it it's not going to suit them well because their their goal is to get that ransom paid. So if they string you along or they don't provide that decryption key and that becomes the general sense in the ecosystem of what's going on, then nobody's going to pay the ransom, right? Because there's no hope of getting it back anyway. So at that point, why would we do it? So they very much have this economy that they're trying to maintain as well. Um, and so have there been cases where certain ransomware groups were maybe just doing it for kicks or maybe their systems didn't function properly or they had issues on their side where maybe they weren't actually able to provide the proper decryption key? Yes, that happens. Um, but I would say generally their economy is, hey, we want to show you that we're, we're, we have good service. And I think we could probably touch on that in a minute. But the way that they function, they are full businesses. They are full-fledged organizations. They have support help desks. They've got everything under the sun, just like we do. And um, and so they want to keep that economy going and they want companies to pay because that's how they continue to grow and, and continue to do what they do. Mark Russ Adams. asked a great question. Um, he says, can you get in trouble for paying the ransom because it could be funding for criminal activity? Paul, let's, I'll let you jump into that one. Yeah, so that is something I'll I'll should go back to the incident that you know I start shared at the start there and talk to that one specifically. So one of the things, so in addition, so the three main parties we engaged with to help respond to the incident, besides myself and our engineering teams, were the defer legal counsel and a negotiating specialist that specializes in negotiating with these threat actors. And one of the main things that if we had gone down that route of seriously contemplating um paying the ransom they had already kind of started setting the legwork up for was validating who these threat actors were now i'll be honest i think it's a little bit of a ludicrous concept because you know these are criminals that their act is inherently criminal but whether or not that criminal is on a prohibited list of individuals essentially organizations is what's going to drive whether or not you're allowed to pay them um, and so if the attackers, you know, unknown um, sanctioned organization or, or the people receiving the funds might be a known sanctioned individual, that's where you might get in trouble if you do actually make that payment. I would encourage organizations very strongly to consider not making that payment in the first place, regardless of who it's going to, because we don't want to keep funding this ecosystem. However, also very re much recognizing that sometimes you need to. Um, so as we think about that, yes, in theory, you could get in trouble. But usually from what I've seen and the studies I've, I've, I've read up on, it's based on, is that payment going to a sanctioned individual or not? So. I've heard both of you reference a lot of tools or toolkits throughout. Uh, Rajiv asked, do, do you use any specific tools for detecting the ransomware issue? How did you restore files or did you lose data and go back to the last good backup that wasn't infected? I know we've answered a little bit of that throughout already, but if you could speak to the rest of the question. Why don't I jump in and answer the second half first, and then Mark, do you want to talk to tools? Uh, so uh, yes, they did restore files. Um, they went to last known good backup, which had been the prior Friday. This was an organization that, you know, because the attack happened the Tuesday morning, um, the prior Friday's backup was good enough. They lost a little bit of transactions over the weekend that from some people working the weekend, but they were able to, you know, kind of restore that data as, to a good enough quality. Um, if you are, if you're an organization that has super high frequency transactions that you need to know, hey, you know, the several thousand transactions that have happened in the last hour all need to be recorded and guaranteed to be correct, that probably doesn't work for you. But for them, that was an acceptable restoration point. Um, so yes, in that case, they did restore the data that they had lost um, to a, a good enough backup. Mark, you want to speak to the tools piece? Yeah, so, you know, generally on that side of things, you know, uh, many organizations, as a matter of fact, this is showing up on cyber insurance attestation statements where they're asking organizations about the protections that they have in place. And um, one of the things that we talk with uh, many about is endpoint detection and response, having some type of a tool set in place that is protective of the workstation that has the ability to detect behavior uh, that is not common to the user. You know, um, many of these tool sets um, are using, you know, advanced technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, 
um, to really understand uh, typical normal user behavior and pattern, and then start to detect and look for things that are not normal or central to the user. Um, and when we do detect those things, then at that point, we quarantine that asset, we take it offline, we isolate it from the rest of the assets on the network, and we give it a review, you know, so that's, that's really the goal of that EDR software. And that's why cyber insurance carriers are pushing on it so hard. Um, it doesn't mean it's going to stop at 100% all the time. Um, but it certainly is, it, we talk about, especially in the cybersecurity space, defense and layers. You know, so we talked about early on about, you know, having a good security awareness training program in place where lots of organizations have 30% of their staff that are potentially clicking links or opening malicious attachments. Well, if that happens, what's our backstop? What's our next layer of defense to prevent that type of a situation where we deploy malicious software to an endpoint that at that point is able to do reconnaissance? and start looking through the environment to see what they can take advantage of. So, you know, having these types of tools in place are really helpful for early warning detection. Um, one of the other things we talk to organizations about as well is um, a SIM environment. And that's uh, that we love our acronyms in IT. Um, and that's S-I-E-M, and that stands for Security Information Event Management and Monitoring. So um, this is really just, you know, understanding at an aggregate, everything that's going on across the organization. We're looking at our servers, we're looking at Microsoft 365, we're looking at firewall activity, we're bringing all of that stuff together and we're analyzing that data. We're looking for trends, we're looking for patterns that indicate that a threat actor is doing something in our environment. There's something that's going on that is not normal and this traffic is unexpected. And so we wanna raise awareness to that, we wanna take a look at it and we wanna address it. So that, there's a couple of examples of a couple tools in there. And, and Mark, I, I think you and I are having a lot of those conversations about the detection and response platforms, that whole security stack. I, I think there's a couple of things that I run into on a, because this is a conversation I'm having just about every day. Um, and there's a lot of challenges and confusion in trying to make sure you've got the right tech stack out there because just about every one of these vendors is coming out with a platform. Every one of these security vendors is coming out with a platform that they're saying does it all. It's got the SIM in it. It's got the endpoint security piece in it. It's got the network detection and monitoring piece in it. Um, but the reality is they're all different and they don't all have the same capabilities, even if they you know, say, oh yeah, no, we have this comprehensive platform that does it all. And so it's really important when you're looking at this to focus less on, hey, what's the exact name of the tool and what's the acronym they use from a marketing perspective on it? and more focus on what's the actual capabilities that it needs to have. There's probably three main buckets of capabilities that I would focus on for, make that for. Four main buckets of capabilities we want to make sure we have covered. The actual monitoring of the activity on the endpoints like Mark was talking about. Does this activity look normal? Because attackers are not deploying that malware file anymore until the very last moment. They know that the AAV tools that we've historically used will block the actual malware file. So they make sure they can get in and disable AV before it actually gets there. And that's why these EDR tools are, are so much more effective at stopping these is because it's looking at the activity of the, the attacker itself. So we have the endpoint co coverage, monitoring of the traffic on the network, commands that are being sent off to your Active Directory domain controller or something like that. Um, a comprehensive uh, log kind of aggregation and, and analysis tool like the SIM that Mark was talking about that may be kind of a separate SIM or that might be baked into the platform. Uh, a lot of organizations that have that SIM baked in are calling that an XDR. Um, lots of acronyms, it doesn't get confusing at all. Um, and then the fourth piece is identity and trust, right? So monitoring the actual logging of the users and especially with all this remote access that everyone has these days, how do you trust that that person that's logging in remotely actually is the person that's your, that they say they are? What if they've captured that password or were compromised MFA? Because even that can still happen. Um, and so really you need to look at, okay, do we have those four buckets covered at least? And will the platform connect into the pieces of your environment that it needs to effectively? Oftentimes you might say, yeah, that tool has those four pieces of the platform, but maybe it doesn't actually connect to your firewall. Your firewall and that tool are not set up to actually activate that monitoring process. And so it's really important to take the time to do your diligence on these products and say, what do we need? Are we getting those four functionalities at least covered? And is it going to work in our specific use cases? 
So if you just go buy one of these without having done that, you could wind up with a product that's not giving you what you need. Thank you. Nathan asked a really great question. Um, what's the normal timeline in which an incident needs to be reported to the insurance company? Or is that dependent on the policy? And then would it be wise to inform insurance companies of events as soon as they happen, even if there's not remediation needed? What if they didn't steal anything? You've caught them or figured it out before. Yeah, it, that is um, something that is going to be specific to your policy. Um, and honestly, I most of the policies I've looked at don't do a very good job of defining what is something that is reportable versus not. Um, and it, it gets challenging because just because there's not a claim that arises out of it, you know, that particular thing that happened, maybe a user account got compromised and you guys know that yeah, the organization fixes it before there's any downstream impact. But, um, you know, how do you know that that's the end of the attack? And so while that you may have contained that particular piece, maybe the attacker has used that account already to get somewhere else in the environment and leave themselves persistence let themselves stay in the environment long term. And um, so uh, it's a very fine line of, hey, what is something that needs to be reported versus not? And it can be a challenge. I would say have some upfront conversations with your insurance carrier about it, about what needs to actually be reported to you. What's that threshold of when needs to when something needs to go to them? And then I would personally err on the side of telling them more than less. Because if you tell them and you know you tell them proactively and there's no claim, it's not like they're all of a sudden likely going to be, you know, charging lots more money for the rest of the period of coverage because there's no claim out of that. Uh, but you can make sure then that if there's a subsequent incident down the road where it, you, they can tie it back to that original uh, issue, then they, uh, it's much less likely they would actually deny your claim because you've notified them of that earlier incident. Unfortunately, there's not just a straight answer on that. It's something that really takes time to really have those conversations, understand what's going on, and, and evaluate, is this something that needs to be reported? And I'll, I'll just jump in and I'll say, um, you know, on, on both those points, yes and yes. I think really the two big major calls for most organizations is their insurance carrier and then their legal, their, their legal defense team. So they're going to have in-house counsel. Um, generally, when these situations will kick off, um, many cyber insurance providers have what, what are called panel providers. Um, and these are the organizations that they have established contractual relationships with to perform the forensic investigative process. And they will bring in breach counsel to assist clients if you would like to use them. Uh, if you have your own in-house counsel that you would like to use, you can do that. Um, but they will bring in breach counsel to work with you on any notification that may be needed, if there was sensitive information that may have been involved, if data may have been exfiltrated out of the organization. And so because of the fact, um, you know, many organizations do hold some type of sensitive data, whether it be human resources, whether it be financial, there's always the risk that our data has been tampered with, has been exposed, may have been exfiltrated out of the organization in a certain situation. And so that's where that forensic investigative uh, component really comes in to determine, one, what was ground zero, what, what was the category at which they entered the organization, right? So we talk about those sublimits by policy. Um, and then also, was there data loss? Um, you know, when I think about the, uh, there was a law that was passed in 2022, it's called the Strengthening American Cybersecurity Law. And they've actually enforced some new uh, guidelines for reporting these situations up. So really having that incident response plan in place of going, okay, this is what I need to do. This is the order of operations that I need to follow is very, very critical. And one of the things that's important in there is this notification to your insurance carrier and to legal counsel and making sure that everybody is kind of looped into that process, because that's going to guarantee that you're within your window. Um, and also the other thing that I talk about is, you know, you want to follow what their, what your insurance company would like you to do. Um, because if you, for example, we serve a lot of clients uh, as a managed service provider for Raymond, we serve a lot of organizations and their natural reflex might be to just call Raymond. I'm just going to call Raymond. They take care of all my IT stuff. So they're going to help me with this situation. And so generally when those calls come in, we're kind of asking that question and going, hey, you've got that cyber insurance policy. We really need to pick up the phone and we need to make that call. 
And the other thing that I would say too, is when we talk about incident response planning is also incident response testing. You can absolutely work with your broker and you can absolutely work with the insurance company to tabletop what it would look like. Hey, kind of walk me through, if I had to call in and I had to open a claim, what does it look like? How long does it take for engagement? When typically is a forensic company involved? I understand that you have different panel providers that I can choose from. Can I see that list now? Having some of those proactive conversations earlier in the process before it hits and getting that into your incident response plan is really going to help you to know what the order of operations are so that you're not missing any steps. And the same thing with the Strengthening American Cybersecurity Act. There's now going to be some reporting requirements. So being very aware of what your responsibilities are as an organization is very important and practicing that ahead of time is the key to get there. Michael added a comment um, in the Q&A. It says, if you're a government contractor, you must adhere to rapid reporting in accordance with DFARS 252.204-7012. So, you know, are there reporting requirements outside of your insurance carrier that people need to be aware of related to these? <laughs> that is a, uh, Michael, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because we really didn't talk about that concept. And your spot on DPARS, which is for those that are not aware, I will not go through that whole string, is the Department of Defense uh, rules and regulations over contracting, essentially, along with a whole bunch of other rules and regulations, too. So that particular piece is something that you might have seen a lot of activity on really lately in the news or, or uh, discussion of, because that's the, hey, how do we secure our defense supply chain concepts that's going to go through this whole change in, in some point here in the next year or two? with the implementation of CMMC. Um, point being though, there is a very strict requirement to report an incident that impacts the DOD you know, confidential unclassified data that's covered by those DFARS clauses. Other agencies are starting to roll out similar uh, rules and regulations. For example, DHS, Department of Homeland Security, just in the last week or two put out their final rules uh, similar to what the DOD has in place, and I expect the rest of federal agencies to also put some sort of reporting requirement in as well. Additionally, if you have credit card data, there's PCI DSS uh, reporting requirements. I mean, basically, if you are in a regulated space of some sort, you process credit cards, you're, you're supplying an agency, there's many reasons you could be regulated. Almost all of those have some sort of reporting requirement so that in addition to contacting your insurance agency, you got to be uh, reporting to uh, who you're providing contracts to, uh, whether that's agency or, or credit card companies, et cetera. A couple other things I'll just uh, knock out here in the questions before we start wrapping up um, and kind of get to the last little bit of content before we close out. The... Um, so uh, DFAR is covered. Connie asked a great question about who should be driving the conversations and accountability for cybersecurity. This is something that is also uh, a, a mindset shift that I work with a lot of my clients on. Cybersecurity is, yes, there's technical components of it and IT needs to be at the table, but it is not IT in and of itself. It needs to be a joint process, a joint conversation between the operational business, finance, accounting departments, and IT. Because IT can implement, but IT is not really the one that should be making those risk judgment calls about, hey, what can our business afford? And that really needs to come from the operational leadership teams that actually uh, you know, drive a lot of the actual value add of your company. Not saying IT is not value add. So it's important to join process and not just sitting with the IT piece. So, um, Thank you, Paul. Um, Lots of great questions. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We are going to wrap up. As we mentioned at the start, there will be a copy of the recording sent out that will go out yet this week. And any questions we were not able to get to, we will send some follow-up communication after the 4th of July holiday as well. Um, Mark and Paul, what closing comments or takeaways do you have for people from today's conversation? Mark, any last thoughts before I kind of- Yeah, so, pieces? yep, absolutely. I'll jump into that. I mean, and it's kind of up on the screen here, but, um, you know, continue to invest in cybersecurity protections. Um, this is just an area that is constantly evolving. It's constantly changing. And, you know, when we think about, um, you know, very much cybersecurity is a cat and mouse game. 
Um, attackers and defenders are always changing their tactics, changing their approach. And all in the middle of that, we have applications, we have third-party vendors, we have hardware and software, we have things that are vulnerable and susceptible. And so these things are constantly changing. So being aware and being on top of what's going on in your organization, what are the protections that you have in place? Um, you know, largely the big driver, um, and I've kind of said this in a few circles, is that really within the commercial space, um, the insurance companies have really kind of become the regulators. I mean, they're kind of setting the standard to say, this is these are the things that you're going to need to have in place in order for us to continue or, or provide you a policy. And so really getting a hold of those things, identifying those things that uh, are good baseline best practice recommendations, but also sitting down and risk assessing your business, understanding your data, understanding your operations, understanding how impactful a cybersecurity event and downtime would be to your organization is a great way to back your way into, okay, these are all the things that we need to get in place uh, to make sure that we can stay up, we can continue to serve our customers um, and have these good protections in place. Um, assessing yourself, uh, working with a, a good organization uh, like Raymond that can do internal external ex internal and external vulnerability and penetration testing, you know, assessing your organization and making sure that you've got the windows and the doors uh, locked down. So that'd be a couple of things that I would say there. Well, and on the testing your security piece, Mark, I, I maybe one of my final comments is it's more than just testing the technical pieces of your security. There's a lot of operational controls that feed into the effectiveness of your security program. Like, do you timely remove access after uh, personnel departure? You may believe you do, but are you actually actually in as quickly as you should? Uh, the NSA and CISA, by the way, put out, a, you know, I think it was one of their, in the last year, they said that, you know, untimely removal of terminated access is one of the, the key things they see out mm -hmm. there as, as driving cybersecurity incidents. So when you're testing your security, it's not just testing the technical, it's also bring someone in to evaluate how are you actually doing from a operational effectiveness over the kind of higher level security controls that should be in place. Um, on this right security tool set, I, there was some couple questions, like one along the way asked about MFA uh, and does MFA, should, should that be in place on VPN? I would say yes, absolutely. MFA, frankly, should be in place on VPN in any web accessible system. And if it's not in place, don't trust that system secure. Uh, however, as you look at the rest of your security tool set, we've talked about some things here that are really good practices, but there's really no one size fits all answer to really uh, answer that across the board. So when you're looking at do you have the right security tool set, it's not a checklist. It's a process of really making sure you have a strategy that evaluates your risks, evaluates your environment, and says, what is the right security tool set for us? So that's the last couple of things that I would focus in on. Um, and, uh, and then always happy to have a follow-up conversation. Feel free to reach out to Mark or I, uh, or anyone here at the Raymond team. Definitely happy to uh, talk with you and, and help figure out how you address your own uh, personal needs. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Paul and Mark, for taking time today and for all of our attendees for joining. Again, this session was recorded and will be made available to attendees and posted on our website. Um, so that information will come out yet this week. And then again, we'll set some follow-up communication with any Q&A we didn't get to after the holiday. So, all right. I hope everyone time. has a great 4th of July holiday. And um, again, please reach out to Paul or Mark if you have any other questions or think of things after the webinar today.